right, the title of my sermon this morning is A Difficult Decision, Choosing to Be Like God That the World Has Forgotten. As we uh, heard already in our scripture reading in Jonah 4, verses 10 and 11, we're, we're really going to be um, focusing on the book of Jonah in general, the full story but the reason I want to focus on the end of the book and our scripture reading, and we're going to end up there by the end of the sermon, is because um, this climax of the story happens here. But then it ends, if you notice this, it ends without any resolution. It's an interesting book in that way. So we're going to talk about why Jonah might have written the book that way and what it means for us in our lives today. Last year, my wife and I got to spend some time in Israel. We got to see lots of uh, amazing sites that previously we had only read about. We saw Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. We saw multiple places where Jesus may have been buried. We saw the Garden of Gethsemane, which was wonderful to be able to sit and pray where Jesus prayed. Uh, we were able to see Oscar Schindler's grave. Uh, we saw where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and we saw the Tomb of David, the Wailing Wall, and, and the Temple Mount. But one of our favorite places was Galilee. Galilee was beautiful, and it, it really surprised us because most of the place is very deserty, and at least at the time that we were there, which was kind of their springtime, it was very lush and green and beautiful. We got to sail on the very water where Jesus walked out to his disciples in the boat. Now, much of the story in Scripture about Jesus takes place around the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a freshwater lake, interestingly enough, even though it's called the Sea of Galilee. They've started in some modern versions calling it something like Lake Gennesaret. Uh, and of course, today it's still called the Sea of Galilee, but people know uh, that it's a lake. It's about 13 miles uh, from north to south and seven miles across, which is not as big as you would think it would be. Uh, now, that's quite a bit longer from top to bottom, uh, but east to west, it's about the length of Lake Geneva. So if you imagine yourself looking out from one end of Lake Geneva to the other, it's about that far across. So it turns out a lot happens around the Sea of Galilee in Scripture, not just in the story of Jesus. In fact, Jonah lived in Galilee. Now, Jonah is an interesting character in Scripture, to say the least, right? He, he's one that is kind of a hard nut to crack. You know, we're not always totally sure what to do with Jonah. Jonah was a true prophet of the true God of Scripture. Amen? How do we know this? Well, the book starts out by telling us that God gave him a message to give to a group of people. So that's one sign of a prophet. And not only that, he was perhaps one of the most successful prophets. Even Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who are considered the mighty major prophets, all struggled to get their message across in a way that really landed with their audience. They were all, you know, really ultimately rejected. But Jonah ends up preaching a message that hits home and changes a pagan people. So he was very successful in a way, you could say. But even though the message he preaches ends up being successful, the vibe that we get from Jonah is not a real positive one. Because as much as he is a true prophet called by the true God to give a true message and a successful one at that, he does not want that job. There are various reasons for this. The most apparent is that the Ninevites were pagans and they sacrificed children to their gods and they were brutal to their enemies and they were just overall bad news. And he wasn't trying to get mixed up in that. But the less obvious but very present reason is that Jonah has no interest in seeing those people receive salvation. This is very clear if we go to chapter 4, verse 2. He says, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God, 
and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. And I'm reading this angrily because Jonah is angry about God's graciousness. So it is apparent that Jonah fears for his own safety, but less than he fears that God is a merciful God who will save his enemies. His bigger fear is the grace of God. Have you ever feared, oh, come on this morning church, have you ever feared just how merciful God is? Have you ever had the thought, I'd love to spend eternity with Jesus, but if so-and-so is going to be there, I don't know if that's the place for me. We've all had thoughts like this. And here we find a true prophet of God, one with a successful message, struggling, not with God's condemnation, which is typically what people seem to struggle with, but with God's mercy, because he is prejudiced against a group of people and he does not want salvation for them. Somebody say mercy this morning. If I could give the book of Jonah a catchier title, it would be this. How far will you let your hate push you away from God's calling? If I can put things into modern terms, the answer to this, to this question for Jonah is immense. The geography is interesting. Uh, and, and I want to encourage you, if you do have a phone that has an app that will show you the world, uh, check it out, whether it's now or whether it's later, um, because reading this story and hearing the old names and not understanding the context doesn't do the story justice. Seeing for myself uh, definitely added dimensions to the story that I never fully understood. You see, since Jonah lived in Galilee, that's on the eastern side of Israel, about 85 miles from the closest port, which is Joppa. Nineveh is about where modern-day Mosul is in Iraq. By car today, that would be about a 15-hour drive. By foot, probably more like nine days if you never stopped. So probably more realistically, um, this is a journey that would take maybe three weeks. You know, this, would, this because if you're going to be stopping and taking breaks and you're going to be setting up camp and all of that, it'd probably take him about three weeks to get to Nineveh. Now, that's a long way to go to deliver a message for the people of Nineveh. So we could maybe understand his ambivalence about going such a long way to spend time with a bunch of people that he doesn't like. It's relatable. However, the story tells us that instead of making the three-week journey to Nineveh, he instead goes to Joppa. Now, Joppa still exists. Um, Allison and I actually went there during our time in Israel. You'll probably hear the, the, the name Tel Aviv, which is a big city in Israel on the Mediterranean Sea. Now, Joppa and uh, Tel Aviv are kind of north and south of the same city. And what they call it now with the pronunciation is more like Yafo. So Y-A-F-O. Um, but this is the same place, same name. And it's actually where Simon the Tanner lived. Uh, so it's at his house where the Apostle Peter stayed during the book of Acts as he was ministering to new Christians. Joppa is the nearest port to Jonah, but it's really not that near, as I said. Uh, it was about 85 miles, and that's probably a good two or three days, uh, at least, of traveling by foot or donkey or however it was that, that he traveled. How far will you let your hate push you away from God's calling? But that's not all that crazy. It seems like a reasonable journey compared to what comes next. The crazy part is where he's trying to go from Joppa. Tarshish, his ultimate destination, is in the southern part 
of what we would call Spain today. Now, Joppa is the easternmost port in the Mediterranean Sea. It's all the way at that very eastern tip where Israel is. And if you travel all the way across on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea, on the very tip of the point on the west, there is Tarshish. By the way, I couldn't calculate a way um, to uh, figure out this, how long it would take by boat today, right? But this is a 2,300 mile journey. It's a lot more than hiking a few weeks to Nineveh. He's taking on this epic journey. Um, it would take about two and a half days of nonstop car travel today, which is about like driving to Los Angeles and back from Kenosha. That's a long trip, but he's taking it on boat, and of course, as you're stopping at different ports along the sea, as his ship captains probably were, this is something that would probably take at least weeks, probably months, to get to his destination. How far will you let your hate push you away from God's calling? These details are important because I'm pretty sure in cartoon versions of this, uh, <laughs> of this story that maybe our kids watch, I know I watched them as a kid, God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh, and Jonah responds by running away and sprinting to the port at Joppa, hopping on a boat, and it's like this high-speed chase where God is going to get what he wants, and Jonah is just trying to outrun God. But running away from God, as many of us know by experience, can I hear mercy this morning, is much slower. It can take years, even decades, of planning to run away from God. Now, of course, this story tells us that we can never really escape him. He is always with us, and that's a good thing, amen? When God starts moving on Jonah's heart to go to Nineveh, and he runs from his calling, it takes a while to transpire. I'm sure that, his plan, that he plans out his trip to Tarshish, right? He saves up money. He packs his bags. He perhaps even sends messages ahead to let people in Tarshish know he's coming so that he knows he has a place to stay. Maybe he has a sister and a brother-in-law and their family who live there, and he's saying, I'm going to come live with you for a while. So this isn't an overnight or same-day story. This is a life decision. He intentionally plans out a different life for himself than God calls him to. And the thought is, perhaps if I can get far enough from the place that I feel God is calling me, that maybe God will change his mind and come up with a new calling for me. Have you ever felt this before? And it doesn't take physical distance, but it does take mental planning. And that's what's going on here with, with Jonah. Maybe God will give me a task that I would prefer if I just make this move. How far will you let your hate push you away from God's calling? So Jonah is on the boat. We're not told for how long, but I would imagine a couple few days. And a storm comes, and you know the story, right? This is the part that we tell to the kids. This is the part that we focus on. The sailors are doing all they can to fight God's tempest, but it is not enough. They throw cargo off the ship, but it's not enough. They cry out to their gods, but it's not enough. And finally, they find Jonah fast asleep in his room. And they wake him up because they need all the help they can get. Now, Jonah is sleeping the peaceful sleep of someone who has left responsibility behind. Finally, someone came up with the idea to cast lots, to draw straws, which seems like a pretty pagan thing to do, but interestingly enough, God works through this process in Scripture quite often. Anyway, a lot, the lot falls on Jonah, and at that point, he fesses up, right? He's running away from his God. He tells them, as a true prophet of the true God, 
if they throw him into the seas, that the storm will end. Now, these sailors have compassion, right? He has brought all sorts of trouble into their lives. He was sleeping, and he didn't care about them. He is offending his God, and it's bringing trouble on them. And yet, they resist his advice, and they keep trying to save the ship and their lives and his life in other ways because they would rather give their lives and sacrifice than throw a stranger and do him the disservice of killing him in the water. But as time goes on, it's apparent that their efforts are fruitless. Jonah realizes that he's not going to Tarshish. And if he can't have life his way, well, maybe the better answer would be death. How far will you let your hate push you away from God's calling? So he finally convinces the sailors to kill him to save themselves. They realize they have no choice, and they finally throw him over, and lo and behold, the storm ceases. The big fish swallows up Jonah, and he has some soul-searching to do. Finally, he breaks down and tells God that he'll go to Nineveh if his life is spared. Now, in the cartoons, the, the fish spits up Jonah on the shore of this magical lake that doesn't exist, that's right outside the city of Nineveh. You can see it from the shore. And he brushes off some seaweed and some slime and goes right to work. Well, I don't think it happened exactly like that. Uh, he probably, I would say, uh, best case scenario, gets spit back up in Joppa. And at that point, has a few days hike home, probably gathers new supplies, which have all been thrown off the ship, probably gets clean clothes, and finally makes the trek of a few weeks' journey out to Nineveh. Now, he preaches a message of doom and destruction. If the Ninevites don't repent, God will destroy them, and of course, he convinces himself, starting to maybe enjoy the trip a little bit, that he has nothing to worry about. They are terrible people, they will reject God's message, and he will destroy them. And he takes a little pleasure in that. These are now facts in Jonah's mind, and he goes to sit down after preaching a little ways outside of the city to watch the fireworks. He's ready to see Nineveh burn, but to his dismay, God's message is effective. Now, I don't know if he's the best prophet or the worst prophet, because he's looking and he's going, God, what gives? The people repent. The leaders repent. The city turns to God, and Jonah feels like he's traveled all this way for nothing. God could have at least let him see his enemies get roasted. But instead, he looks like a chump. The city didn't catch on fire. His enemies are brought salvation, and Jonah is mad. Now, this brings us to where we started this morning. And what I want to do is, if you'll turn with me to chapter 4, we're going to read it in its entirety. It's not a long chapter, but it really sums up how Jonah is feeling, how God responds, and then what happens next. It displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. This is the English Standard Version. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh God, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. It's almost a comedy. Because, we're, because the irony does not escape us, right, of what's going on here. He is so mad at God for being a good God. This is the story we need to show people when they say, God is so mean. <laughs> Look at him. So mad that God is so good. Therefore, O Lord, please take my life from me. What was our question this morning? How far will you let your hate take you away from God's calling for your life? Take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Does it make sense for you to be angry? Are you not a true prophet of the true God whose message just came true? Because you preached repentance. They repented. Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of their city and sat on the east side and made a booth for himself there, and he sat under it in the shade until he could see what would become of the city. Now, the Lord had appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. And the worm attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, then God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked again that he might die, and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. This is a hilarious conversation. It, it is, but it isn't, right? Because it's serious. He wants to end his life. But he doesn't catch the irony that he's mad about the plant, but not about the people. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? And the story ends there. Did you notice that the story doesn't actually end? Jonah does not give a conclusion to his story. Yes, the story for the, the Ninevites ends well, right? It concludes well for the Ninevites, but they're not the main people in the story. In many ways, this is a story about how pagan people turn to the true God of Scripture because of the true prophet. First, the sailors come to know the true God, and they repent, and they try to save this man they haven't even met before. And then later, the Ninevites tear their clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, repent of their sins, pray to the true God of Scripture, and He has mercy on them. In many ways, the story has already ended, and it's a good conclusion. But the way that it really ends can leave a bad taste in our mouth if we don't know what's going on. Because we don't know why the kind of hero, or maybe anti-hero of the story, doesn't get it. When it comes to the main character, the story does not resolve. Of course, we like to think that God's reasoning works with Jonah, and that he repents and he goes to live in Nineveh with his new best friends, the Ninevites. However, it could be that it, he continues to let his hate drive him further and further from the God that he serves. How far will you let your hate push you away from God's calling? I think Jonah ends his book this way on purpose. He's asking the reader to put themselves in his shoes. And so he doesn't feed the reader the correct answer. He wants you to wrestle with the emotions that he's feeling at the end of this story. He's asking the question, who are your Ninevites? Who are the people that you would rather not see in heaven? Who are the people that if God sent you to preach salvation, you would rather go the opposite direction? Now, I'm saying you, but I'm included in this, right? We're all human. We all have feelings. We all have thoughts about people, right? Right? 
We all have people who we'd perhaps rather die or risk our own salvation rather than bringing Jesus to them. That's not something we like to admit, but it's at least something that crosses our mind. I preached a sermon once about Paul's conversion. Paul was leading violent bands of Jews to go and kill these Christians, right? These new followers of Christ shortly after his ascension. He meets Jesus and he becomes blind. And God tells Ananias to go and to pray with him and to give him back his sight. Ananias amazingly went to Paul, and Paul's sight was indeed restored. And I asked the congregation when I preached this message, if the leader of a Christian persecuting group, let's say ISIS, was down the street, God says, go a couple of blocks that way, and you're going to come to a house, and in that house is the leader of ISIS. He has lost his sight, and you are going to give it back. How would you feel? It's uncomfortable. And I, even as I was talking about this with a pastor friend of mine who was ex-military, he responded, I know exactly what I would do if I knew the leader of ISIS was two blocks away. And he wasn't talking about giving him a hug, friends. The world right now wants us to hate. Is that a true statement? Everything we read and hear and watch these days is how you should hate these people because they voted for this person. You should hate these people because they stood up for this issue. You should hate these people because they have an opinion that you don't agree with. And friends, I get it. I get caught up in it. It's hard not to, amen? But we are called to something higher. We are called to bring the good news of Christ's salvation, his love for all people, his sacrifice for all people, his desire to see them with him in eternity. And sometimes this is going to include folks that we don't care much for. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, uh, which we might not have, by the way, if it wasn't for brave Ananias, going to give a terrorist his eyes back. We read, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How far will you let your hate push you away from God's calling? Or will we instead let love pull us toward his calling? The world wants us to conform into being haters, but God calls us to be lovers. We are called to love God and to love our neighbor. So Jonah invites you this morning to make a decision. Do we run from God's calling in hate? Or do we run towards his calling in love? It's my hope and my prayer and my challenge this morning that starting with today, we check ourselves. This is something I have to do too. We check our thoughts and our motives, and we ask the question, what is God calling me to do today, and who does he want me to minister to? Will you commit to that this morning? And when God does indeed call you, don't try going to Spain. I mean, if he's calling you there, then go for it. But go where he is calling you. It's my belief from Scripture that this is where you'll find God's richest blessings. After all, Jonah might have had a bad attitude, but he did eventually go, and God made him one of the most successful prophets in all of Scripture. And we can find that same success when we answer that call for ourselves.
I want to invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, we're humbled by this message this morning. I know that it's a temptation for me to look at all of what's going on in the world and to, to get all worked up by the hate that's going on around us. We all have tendencies towards that, but Father, today we ask that since it is your Sabbath, you help us to abide in you. That you show us a picture of your love, that you show us a picture of your mercy and your grace. And let us not be like Jonah and be offended by this love and this mercy and this grace, but instead embrace it. Instead, let it permeate our being. Let us die to self so that Christ lives in us so that we are empowered to go where you are calling us and to minister to whom you would have us bring the good news to. That's not always easy for us, Father, but we thank you for the opportunity and we thank you for involving us in your plans because you are a God who calls us to be his hands and feet right here and to minister to those in need. If we won't go, then who? And so I pray, Lord, that you would give us the attitude of Isaiah, when you said, whom will I send and who will go for us? Let us say, here am I, send me. Let us be, let that be our motto this morning. And as we go out to our separate places, keep us safe, keep that message in our heart and give us a burden to share the good news with someone today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.